Psalms 85, 6, wasn't it? Amen. Thanks Will so. thou not revive us again? That people may rejoice in thee. Boy, I tell you, we need some rejoicing. We need some happiness. We need some things to happen. And man, I'm telling you, we're excited about what's going on tonight. So we hope pray that it'll be a blessing to you. You pray for us as we go through the service. So let's, let's get ready to pray tonight. Dear Lord, we're so thankful tonight to be in your house. And Lord, be amongst your people here, Lord, with Mike and Jim and more those are on by way of internet. Lord, what a blessing it is, Lord, to be able to minister even in the midst of a pandemic. Lord, we pray tonight that you'll bless our efforts. Lord, you'll take what we have, Lord, and just use it and multiply it. I remember the old song, a little as much and when God is in it. Lord, I pray that you'll just take what we can do, Lord, though it may not be much. Lord, we're doing what we can. Lord, you'll bless it and, and use it for your glory. We pray that someone watching tonight that may not be saved, that may not be where they ought to be, Lord, that tonight your Holy Spirit would reach out to them, Lord, get a hold of them, and Lord, draw them back to you. Lord, I pray for the Taylor family tonight, Lord, in the past of the bay. You just comfort them, Lord, and Shirley and, and Jerry and Becky and all of that, Lord, the Taylor and the Hager family, Lord, help them to march they go through this this tough time, God, I know that uh, you will give them grace and strength sufficient. And Lord, we pray tonight for those that are sick and in the hospital yes. and the nursing homes. Lord, our nation, our leaders, Lord, our president, our, our government. Lord, those first responders, those people who are working to try to keep us safe and to help us. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, we know you want to get us through. And Lord, we know that joy is going to come in the morning. And Lord, we ask you to bless tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Mike. Well, I tell you, it's, uh, we were having, as Pastor Mike said, that Mike and Mike moment a little while ago, and uh, we were both getting kind of emotional and excited about it because it's what it's just the way it is in God's family, amen? Yeah. You know, we run off with one another, and I just want to say here, I love this man, my pastor. I appreciate him so much, what he does for the Lord, and uh, but that's the way we should be with one another. We've been praying for you. We've been thinking of you. This song that we're going to sing right now, it, it, it's, it's, it's got two titles. I stand amazed in the presence and also how marvelous. And we were just talking how marvelous God really, really is to us. God bless you tonight as we sing. You sing it out now. Let the Lord hear you. Clap your hands and enjoy the moment as we sing. I stand amazed in the presence. Jim does a great job, doesn't he?
Yes, she yeah, will. Right. All right, got your Bible and I hope up to the book of Mark, chapter number two. Book of Mark, chapter number two. I had to get my water. I had to get my handkerchief there and step off the camera there for just a minute. Mark chapter 2. We'll begin reading verse number 1 tonight. I hope, hopefully, that you'll follow along. You can see it on the screen back there. So, if you're ready, I'm ready. I said a while ago, I don't know if I said uh, when we opened up or not. I generally, when I was preaching revivals and, and, and pastoring and doing all that, I, 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 as I got older in life, I began to practice on the home church, and then it was a pretty good sermon, or you thought it was pretty good, you'd take it out and use it in revival, but tonight I'm going to preach a brand new sermon, God laid on my heart, I'm excited about it, man, I just love the title of it, so let's begin in Mark chapter 2, begin in verse number 1, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Hmm. Well, I just saw something else in that right there. And they and they come to him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up. They let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I want to use for a thought tonight this thought, Revival when Jesus is in the house. Revival when Jesus was in the house. And I just thought, well, you're talking about going to have revival. I'm talking about national revival, church revival, personal revival. Is to make sure that Jesus is in the house. Amen? Because I'm going to tell you what, you can't do anything without him. In fact, I was just thinking today, as I was meditating and thinking on this sermon, that what we need is Jesus back in some houses. We need him back in some government houses. Amen? We need him in some schoolhouses. We need him in church houses. We need him in... Our houses. And I want to tell you, I like what verse 1 said. It was noise that Jesus was in the house. I want to tell you, when Jesus is around, it's an exciting time. I want to tell you, I feel, I feel preaching coming on. I feel joy tonight when I think about, hey, Jesus is in the house. And when Jesus is in the house, things happen. Amen? That's what makes the difference. The Bible says in Psalm 107, verse number 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I want to tell you, listen, there ever was a time that you and I as the church, the body of Christ, I think it's time we make some noise, man, let it out, let it rip, and let the world know, hey, Jesus is alive and well, and Jesus is in the house. Man, that preach right there, wasn't it? Amen. I think the church has been quiet way too long. I think we're going to praise the Lord. Man, I'm going to tell you what, I, God inhabits the praise of his people. Listen, if you don't want to praise the Lord, I'm going to tell you what, God wants you to praise the Lord. Yeah. In fact, the psalmist said, David said one in Psalm 150, verse number 6, listen to what he said. He said, let everything that hath the breath praise, praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. I'm going to tell you what, hey, Jesus is worthy of our praise. And I'm going to tell you, listen, if he's in your house, if he's in your heart, if he's, listen, if you've got Jesus in you, you need to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You need to let people know Jesus. Hey, listen. People say, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? I'll tell you what's wrong with me, man. Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in me. So, I, man, I love that. Amen. So, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder when, if, why we're not seeing much happen in America. It could be this thought. Maybe Jesus is not in the house. I'm going to tell you, read the Bible. Read the Bible, and when you see that Jesus is in the house, listen, I'm going to tell you what things happen. It's exciting. It's soul-stirring. I mean, man, things happen. And, and, you know, I, I can hear you out there asking tonight, well, is it possible for Jesus to not be in a church house? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Revelation chapter number 3, so we have a picture of Jesus talking to the church of last and I want to tell you when it started in chapter number 2 in the church of Ephesus, I, I read the day Brother Mike, hey, Jesus was in the midst of the seven candlesticks walking around. Hey, look at I'm about ready to take off and get behind this thing and choo-choo. Here he goes, he's going to bring 
bring me a chair. He's going to bring me a chair right here. And I, I can just get up there right here. And the chair can come to me. But I want to tell you, hey, listen. I want you to know, listen. Jesus is in the midst of the church. And he's in the midst of the house. And I want to tell you what. He's walking around. And he knows what's going on. Amen. And when you get into chapter 3 of Revelation. And you begin to read about the church at Laodicea. Latin, the Laodicean church was the last of the seven churches. It's the last in the church age. It's the last church before the rapture of the church. And I want to tell you, listen, Jesus knew exactly what was going on. In verse number 20 of chapter number 3, we read, Behold, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I want to tell you, that's a picture of Jesus standing outside the church, the last seen church in the last days and the last ages, knocking on the church door trying to get in. And I want to tell you, one of the most sad, that's one of the saddest pictures you can ever see is the church that Jesus purchased and bought with his own precious blood. He has been put out. He's not even welcome. And Jesus stands and knocks to come in. And it's sad that Jesus will do it. I, I got to tell you, I believe there are multitudes of churches in America where Jesus is not welcome. In fact, they ought to take the sign. You listen to me. You ought to take the sign down and put up country club or put up some kind of organization. But I'm going to tell you, if you're a church of the living God, how in the world can you be a church and Jesus not be welcome? I remember the illustration about an old lady. Man, she, she's about like me. She just heard a shouting spell in church. And she was in one of the churches. They didn't believe in that shout and all that noise and stuff. And they sent two big deacons down to get her to pick her up and carry her out. And said so she shouted all the way out. But said so she could be heard as she was going down the aisle. Those two big deacons carrying her one on each side, just praising the Lord. And she said, Jesus was carried in on one donkey, and I'm being carried out on two, and she's just having herself a time. I'm going to tell you, listen, it is sad that Jesus is not even welcome in many churches in America. i got to say tonight, man, listen, things happen when Jesus is in the house. Yep. I jotted some things down. This is by no means exhausting, but I mean, this is just some things I've thought of. You say, what happens when Jesus is in the house? There's salvation. Man, we talked about that on the mic and Mike she wanted to go back and watch that. If you didn't watch that, man, we had we had church on there and talked about Brother Mike, Pastor Other Pastor Mike's testimony of getting saved. There's salvation, there's renewing, there's praising, there's singing, there's preaching, there's joy, there's gladness, there's healing, there's I, I, there's hope, there's excitement, there's happiness, there's peace. When Jesus is in the house, I want you to know that things happen. Maybe that's why churches have gotten so quiet. Maybe that's why nothing's happened. Now, what you also know something about verse number one? Don't you know something about verse number two? Notice what it says: there was a great crowd gathered to hear Jesus. Wow! I'm gonna tell you, man. Listen, Jesus can steal them all crowd. He can listen. Oh, we got all. We got. And I'm gonna get on that tonight. I've been on that for so many, so many weeks. So I, listen, we got all these newfangled gadgets and all this stuff trying to draw crowds and trying to. What we become an enter, so we become? Oh, help us tonight. We become an entertainment center instead of a church house. But I want to tell you, I just saw that brother Mike when I was reading the text. Jesus had that great crowd gathered, and I'm gonna tell you, what, he did not entertain them. He preached the word to them. Is what verse number two said. Man, listen, if you're going to get a crowd, preach to them. Amen. Jesus said, because if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And I want to tell you, man, I, listen, revival when Jesus is in the house. Well, I see some things in this passage of Scripture. I'm going to give you a couple of points, and then we'll go home. Number one, number one, I see that there was a problem. There wasn't just a problem. There were problems. Let me name some of them for you. There's a big crowd gathered. In fact, the crowd was so big that people couldn't even get close to Jesus. Wow. There was a sick man that needed healed. Man, he couldn't walk. He couldn't bring himself to Jesus. He was dependent upon others. I thought about that. I thought about Brother Jim. If you're watching that, Brother Kanuki, our, our children's youth minister. Man, I want to tell you this. I thought about that. How people need Somebody, they need somebody to bring them to Jesus. The bus ministry, soul winning, visitation, Facebook, whatever it is, we need to bring people to Jesus. That was the problem. 
problem. That man needed to be brought to Jesus. I see another problem. There were people in the way. Talked about the press. They could not, they could not come nigh to him for the press. The press are people. And you know what? I'm going to say this and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to rip right into it right here. I'm going to tell you, you know what keeps most people away from Jesus? Our people. Yeah. People. We don't live like we say we do. We treat people wrong. We do things to people. We don't live godly. We don't let our little light shine. We don't shake our salt out. And I'm going to tell you why people see that and they don't want to come to Jesus because of that. I'm going to tell you, man, listen, the devil's all about I learned when I started preaching 40 some years ago. If you put your eyes on people, you're going, you're going to end up in a world of hurt. You're going to end up in trouble. You're going to end up mad. You're going to end up disappointed. People end up believing the churches. You know why? Because they get their eyes on people. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. And then I saw the problem. They couldn't get to the house. And when they got there, when they got there, they couldn't get in the door. Can you imagine people not being able to get in the church because it was too crowded with people? Well, I want to tell you what these are. I, I did a mini message a couple of I don't know, a few days, weeks ago, on obstacles. And all those things are obstacles just to keep people away from Jesus. And the devil, I want you to know now, if you're not saved, if you're not where you ought to be, I want you to know that the devil has all kinds of obstacles to keep you away from Jesus. In fact, let me just stop and catch my breath a minute and just ask you a question. What obstacle is the devil using to keep you away from Jesus? And you know, then people, I thought about, people have all kinds of excuses. Have you ever seen that? I mean, no, you know, I, you know, as somebody said one, years ago, I heard that, I don't know Brother Mike, Brother Jim's heard that. Somebody said, just tell me you don't have any peanut butter. That's just a good excuse. You know, we try to make up all these excuses. Well, I can't come, I can't do this, I can't get saved, and I can't serve, and I, and I can't be faithful, and I can't be committed. Why don't you say you don't have any peanut butter? That's about as good an excuse as you can come up with. And I found that there are all these excuses and obstacles in this passage of Scripture. You know what? There are too many people. I, you know, I, want, I want to come to a crowd. I, I don't want to be where there's a lot of people. There are too many people. There are too many hypocrites in the church. Everybody knows every hypocrite in the church. Don't let a hypocrite come between you and Jesus. Right. If you can't see Jesus for the hypocrite, the hypocrite's bigger than you. Get out of the way, man, and, and, and see Jesus. I can't get to church. Somebody will bring you to church. We got bands. We got people. We'll haul you to church. I don't have anyone to help me. We'll help you. I don't have transportation. Listen, there are all kinds of obstacles and excuses. And I want to tell you something. Listen, if you want to come to Jesus, the devil will always put obstacles in your way. But I want to tell you, obstacles are just opportunities for Jesus. He's the obstacle mover. Amen. And then I want to see the problem. Number two, I see the prescription. Man, I'm glad. I'm going to tell you, I can just about preach right there. I'm glad. Listen, there's this one thing to have a problem. Can you imagine being sick and not having any medicine, not having any prescription to help you in your sickness? I'm going to tell you, we got a prescription tonight. You said, where is it? Look at verse number four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. You know what the prescription is? He, he, that's Jesus. You know what the prescription is? It's Jesus. I, listen, I'm glad that we got all kind of medicine for all kind of illness, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, well, I got scared. I had to walk away from the camera in the Mike and Mike show. I got to talking about Pastor Mike's uh, testimony of salvation, how God saved him, how he was raised up in Mormonism, and God saved him, and I get so emotional trying to tell that. I had to just let him try to go ahead and tell himself, because I'm going to tell you, I'm excited that we have, listen, we have a prescription for a sin sick soul. Amen. And it's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. These men wanted to get, hey, hey listen, these men that brought their friend to Jesus, they knew Jesus could help. I don't know how they knew it. Maybe it's because it was noise that Jesus was in the house. Man, I want to tell you this. They knew Jesus kept. In fact, they knew Jesus was only help for their friend. 
And you know what? I want to tell you, praise the Lord Jesus is the way. He's the answer for the greatest problem that people have. This, I'm going to tell you now, this, this might make you mad. It might upset you. It might just buff you up a little bit, strap yourself down and hold on. I'm going to tell you, the biggest problem we're facing is not the coronavirus. It's not COVID-19. The biggest problem that people are facing is you're going out into eternity, lost and without knowing Jesus Christ and going to the devil's hell. That's the biggest problem that people have. But I want to tell you, hey, listen. I want to say to you tonight, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus is the answer to every problem you can come up with, and he's the cure for a sin-sick soul. Amen? Amen. I'm going to tell you, man, listen, that's the kind of glad we've got a prescription. I'm glad we've got a prescription for what's ailing us. And I want to say to you tonight, listen, I want to say, listen, man, man, I'm getting hot, I'm getting worked up. It's not religion. It's not being baptized. It's not joining a church. It's not belonging to a club. It's not being a part of some organization. It's not having money. It's not having position. I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you what the answer is. The answer is that every boy, girl, man, woman, child needs to know is the answer is Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that can save your soul. He's the only help you got, and he's a personal friend. It's a personal relationship, amen? Man, I'm going to tell you what, Acts 4, 13, talk about, man, when those guys saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took notice of them, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I'm going to tell you, man, listen, people ought to be able to tell that you've been around the Master. They ought to be able to tell that you've been with Jesus. I'm going to tell you what, when Jesus gets in you, gives you a good dose of the Holy Ghost, man, and fills you up, I'm going to tell you, people ought to be able to tell that you've been all around Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, something happens when you've been with Jesus. I remember reading John chapter 12 about the Greeks that came up to the worship of the feast. And they came to Philip, and they said to Philip, said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you what you need to do tonight. You listen. Don't be listening. You say, I've been hurt. Churches have let me down. Denominations have let me down. Preachers have let me down. Christians have let me down. People have let me down. I want to tell you, hallelujah, there's one that's never let you down. And that's Jesus Christ. Don't look at people. They'll let you down every time. Man, we need to see Jesus. That's who people need to see. You know what? I, <laughs> we've shown people, preachers and and we've, we've shown them churches and we've shown them denominations and we've shown, shown them buildings and we've shown them programs and we've shown them so much stuff and people are coming out dead and dry and dusty and empty and lost and unsaved. You know why? Because nobody's going back hey, and showing them Jesus. Honey, I want to tell you now, this the only thing you need to know is the prescription for your sin sick soul is Jesus Christ. And if you get to him, you can be healed of all your sin problems. Amen? Yeah. Man, listen, the devil, the devil doesn't care if you see the church. He doesn't care if he keeps your eyes on a building or a preacher or a denomination or somebody. He doesn't want you to see Jesus. I'm telling you what, what you see in Jesus, you'll never be the same. Amen? Yeah. Don't give up on finding him. Be determined. Man, listen, these, I thought about these four men. What was it? What did they have that we need? They had something that we need. They were determined. Man, they were determined to get their friend to Jesus. And I didn't tell you all the way to turn, they were desperate. You ask the question, who in the world tears the roof off the house to get somebody to Jesus? I only know one kind of people that do that. Those are desperate people. Have you ever been desperate? Man, I've been desperate. I just about had a fit today thinking about, hey, brother, I think about years ago when I was going, I was going through the valley. You know, if you've been in, if you've served the Lord long enough, they're going to be telling you not always going to be on the mountain. Thank God we're on the mountain right now, but you're not always in the valley. And I was going through the valley, and man, I was just in a desperate place in my life, and I began to pray to God. We were getting ready to go into tent meeting. And I told God, you got to do something. <laughs> Man, I'm going to tell you, he did something. He showed up. And man, I'm going to tell you, he revived my heart. Man, I'm going to tell you what, I was desperate. And man, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you desperate? You say, man, you know what, we're not getting people, we're not getting people lost. They don't realize they're lost. They don't realize that their next breath they could be 
in the devil's hell. They don't realize they can go out in the eternity lost. They don't realize how close they are to being out in the eternity without Jesus. They haven't gotten desperate. I'm asking you a question. Are you desperate? Are you desperate to see God move in your life? Are you tired of low living? Man, I was desperate. I was going through the valley, man, just dragging myself. I was pastoring the church and just struggling along. And I'm going to say hallelujah. God showed up. Jesus showed up and helped me in my desperation. You want to live on a higher spiritual plane? You want to be saved? You want to get right with God? I'm going to say, well, are you desperate? Have you longed for a relationship with Jesus? Have you been wanting to get saved and get back in church and, and get all that sin and all that problem taken care of and the devil put all kinds of obstacles and all kinds of excuses in your way? Are you desperate? In fact, I don't think most people come to Jesus when they're desperate. You know how you find them? Well, you think Jesus would be the first person we turn to, but he's not. We turn to everything in the world. We turn to drugs. We turn to alcohol. We turn to sex. We turn to entertainment. We turn to money. We turn to positions. We turn to our job. We turn to everything in the world. And guess what? You know what? All that will leave you at the end of the day empty on the inside, and you won't have that spiritual thirst quenched that I was talking about today. And I want to tell you, listen: you've got to get desperate to come to Jesus. And you get desperate to see Jesus work in your life. Man, I'm going to tell you, that tried else, nothing to work. They were also, man, they were passionate. They picked their friend up and carried him to Jesus. They were faithful men. Man, listen, they were faithful. They had, they had faith and trust that they got their friend to Jesus. That Jesus could do something about it. And I want to tell you tonight, I, 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 listen, I've got all the faith and confidence in the world in Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've been, what you say, I've done too much. Oh, no, listen, that's a lie, a trick of the devil. You haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much. You're not too young. You're not too old. I want to tell you, those are all excuses and obstacles that the devil puts you in your way. You just need to come to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what, things will be better. He'll save your soul, man, and put you on the way to heaven. Amen. And then number three, not only did I see a problem, not only did I see a prescription, number three, I see a prospect, the prospect. Look at verse number five. When Jesus saw their, saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I looked up the word pride. I was looking for another P to put in my message, and I couldn't come up with the right P. And I, you know, when I done, I just, I just pulled out my, I think I pulled out my, where is my phone? Oh, we're recording. I, I pulled out my phone, and I just asked, <laughs> I just asked my brother Mike to laugh at I just asked Siri, I said, give me, give me some words, or something with P words that, that go with this. I'm trying to work this sermon out, and the word prospect came up. I thought, I don't know about that, so I pushed it up and looked at it in the dictionary. This is what the dictionary said. An unrealized ability that might be developed and lead to success or something greater. I'm going to tell you, what, you talk about the prospect, listen, you've got the problem, you've got the prescription, and I'm going to tell you what the prospect is. Man, listen, it can lead to success or something greater. This man, when he got there, I'm going to tell you what, listen, he got more than he ever bargained for. He got more than he ever imagined. He got there to Jesus, and Jesus, listen, did not only just heal his body physically, Jesus said, thy sins be forgiven to me. Amen. And man, that was the biggest problem that he had. And I heard him tell you, now listen, you give your heart to Jesus, you get far more than you ever imagined. Man, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what When I started out years ago, and I never imagined where I'd be what would happen in my life. I'm going to tell you what, God has brought me farther than I ever thought I would ever go. Man, he's done more in my life. You heard Brother Mike talk on, on, on the program just a minute ago about what God has done in his life. And I'm going to tell you what, because you think about that, man, listen, when you come to Jesus, you say, I'm just coming, I'm ready. I, man, listen, just get up in a chair and take yourself a shot and fit and just raise both hands up and say, hey, you can bring a broken, busted up, torn up body that's ravaged with sin and bring it to Jesus and he can make something great out of it. Mm. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. And then to think about that, not only that, and we're going to get a brand new body. Amen. <laughs> Man, mine's about worn out. I don't know about you, mine's about worn out. 
We're going to get a brand new body in a brand new place and in a perfect place where we'll never grind down, where we'll never grow old. I'm going to tell you what, hey, man, listen, the journey just started. If you're not living for Jesus, and man, you're living, you got low living, and you're living below the plane that Jesus wants you to live on. Jesus came to give you life, and then you might have life and have it more abundantly. I'm going to tell you, hey, I can't hardly get away from that, Brother Mike. The best thing I ever did do was to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior and put my life in His hands and He has blessed me abundantly. Yes. I'm rolling away on the podium here. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto Him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I want to say to you now, man, listen, I'm glad I serve a big God. Yes. You can't carry my God around in your pocket. You can't carry my God around on a chain or a necklace and put him on a key chain. I'm going to say, man, my God is the God of the universe. I want to tell you, listen, my God can do anything. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. That means he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. I'm going to tell you what, there's not a, David said there's nowhere you can go. That's right. To get away. From the presence of God. What a God we serve. Mm. Man, think about that. Revival when Jesus is in the house. Yes. You're listening tonight and you're not saying, I'm going to ask you verse 7. If you bow your head, realize your sin, pray a prayer something like this. Dear Lord, the best I know how. I'm coming to you today. I'm trusting you to save me. I know I can't save myself. And I'm going to give my life to you. And I'm going to tell you what, if you mean that, Jesus will come in and save you right on the spot tonight. And if you're away from God and away from Jesus, man, you, maybe, you, maybe you've just been roaming around out there, back out there in the world. I'm going to tell you, come home. Come home. Come home tonight to Jesus and open your heart up. It'll be the best thing you ever did do is get your heart back right with Jesus. And I hope and pray that you'll pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. While we sing, Brother Mark. Praise the Lord tonight. You come. You come. Come to Jesus. Just as he said. I hope that message stirs your heart. We're going to sing this song. You have to sing. We pray that prayer. Give your heart to Jesus. Whatever your need is right now, this is the moment. Okay? Revival is here for you. It's here to receive it. You asked for it. God brought it to you. Let's sing it now. Yeah. 
do to come to Christ to get rid of all that junk in my life. Amen. And then he came into my life, saved me, Amen. and placed me on the road of salvation. Salvation past, present, future, brother. Amen. Think about this verse as we sing it. If you haven't talked to the Lord yet, this is your moment right here, okay? God bless you tonight.